Hello, everyone. Welcome back for a brand new edition of Collider Connected with one of my absolute favorites. And he knows it. It's William Zapka from Cobra Kai, Karate Kid as well, and a whole bunch of other things that we're going to get to talk about today. How are you doing? Hey, Perry. And you are one of my favorites and you know it too. I know you know it. I I love you and the Cobra Kai team so, so much. And you know, I could talk about Cobra Kai all day long, but the cool thing about Collider Connected is we get to talk about a little bit of everything and you have a whole bunch of accomplishments that I think people need to know about more than they do. As much as we need to celebrate Cobra Kai more, we have to hit on those as well. And I'm going right back to the very beginning with this conversation. What is the very first thing that sparked the urge to become an actor? Was it seeing a specific movie, a performance, maybe your parents working in the industry, you name it? Great question. Well, I grew up in the industry. Uh, my dad was the associate director of The Tonight Show. He was a staff director at NBC. He was an Emmy nominated, Emmy winning director of a soap opera. When I was five years old, I was on a train with him from Long Island to New York City, NBC. And I was, you know, on all the sets walking through you know, opening doors that went to nowhere. So seeing the facades and seeing the makeup getting put on and all that, it was at a very young age, it was impressed upon me. Um, and uh, my father directed a documentary. The first thing I ever did, I was five years old also in my backyard and he directed a documentary based on a song he wrote uh, about five young kids uh, that grew up together and went off to Vietnam. And it starts off in this kind of um, film style narrative and then it turns into documentary footage. And I was the young kid in the backyard with my friends and remembering my dad on the top of a roof with a camera. So it was very, from the time I can remember, um, I've, I've been seeing sets and on all that and then moved to, moved to California when I was a kid. Uh, my dad worked at a, did the love boat and worked with Clint Eastwood, but it was always a hobby. It wasn't something I, I the, the light didn't go off until maybe, maybe 14, 15, when I thought, you know, I would watch like the Bad News Bears movie or and see kid actors. Um, I'm the Littlest Angel, I think, was a movie I saw. And just, I don't know, I always thought that was so cool. I remember being on the set of um, Land of the Lost, the original Land of the Lost, and saw the kid that played Chaka, this kid in this little ape suit, and took, his, took the ape suit mask off and he looked like me. And I remember asking, do we have enough money to pay to be on television? And they said, well, no, they, you get paid to do that. So for me, it was something that was so cool and so fun to do that I was like, all right, sign me up. Are you watching the CNN documentary series about late night TV? I was just watching the Carson stuff and it's like, it's incredible. My folks met on that show. My Ed McMahon gave my parents a wedding gift. Um, my dad was actually on the Carson show as a guest because he was also a composer and wrote a lot of movie themes. So he got to conduct the orchestra. Google that. Google Stan Zapka, Johnny Carson. You see my dad on the Carson show and he's even talking about my folks. It's fast. It's great. But no, I'm not, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that series yet, but I'm going to de definitely check it out. That's the first thing that I'm going to Google when we hang up. Yeah, it's cool. Are, are you, are you a Long Island kid? I am a Long Island kid. I might be recording from Long Island right now. I am also a Long Island kid. What part of Long Island are you in? Nassau County. From Port Washington. Ah, that's right well, nearby. Port Washington's yep. a great area. Very close. Yeah. yeah, and I love it. That my childhood in New York was like amazing. Like the first, it's almost a whole other life. Tons of great friends on the block there. We lived uh, at the end of a bay between two ponds. Um, some of the kids there are still friends of mine, you know, the kids I grew up with. Um, yeah, love New York, love Long Island. I couldn't agree more. So you said you made the decision that you want to pursue acting as a career. And when that happened, what did your parents say? I mean, I'm assuming they were having a very positive experience in the industry and they encouraged you or was there any hesitation there? No, my parents have always been the most supportive parents of whatever I chose to do. Um, it was also too, like I, I also wanted to be a filmmaker. So when I graduated high school, I didn't go to acting school to become an actor. I actually went to film school to become a filmmaker. And acting was like kind of my side thing. Like I play music as well, but I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be in a band. It was so, um, so they're very supportive. My dad having dealt with many different types of actors said, just, you know, keep your head on your shoulders, keep your feet on the ground, stay true to yourself, um, keep your friends. Um, and, uh, you know, so I had, I had some good guidance on that and, but, um, they were fully supportive of that. Um, and, uh, soon after I, I kind of decided to do that, um, I was in college, Cal State Northridge going to film school and I got cast in Karate Kid and, um, and the rest is history sort of. 
I do always like asking about going to film school specifically because it's not a mandatory thing. You could do one or the other and it's whatever feels right to you. But, you know, you brought up film school. I know you started, but then you didn't finish. And I assume that has something to do with getting the Karate Kid role. What was it like making that decision, especially because it, it seems like wanting to be behind the camera has always been important to you? What I realized was I was getting because I after Karate Kid, then it was back to school and just one of the guys in European vacation and the equalizer, my acting career kept going. So I, I had to go on that ride, but I was also realizing I was learning way more than I could ever in school actually doing it and, and seeing the cameras and seeing the DPs and learning what a grip is and what a gaffer is and how to hit your mark and how the actors work. I mean, my film school uh, had, was, was on the job training in, in acting. And, um, and I'd always ask the DPs, you know, what's that, what's that, you know, what, what kind of film is that? And what, what's film stock and what's a lens and you know, what's a prime, what's a, you know, what's a zoom with all those things. I was fascinated by all that. So it was film school for me and I learned so much from that. Um, so for me to go back to, to college to do what I was already doing, um, you know, it didn't seem to make sense, but then I did go back and took some writing classes at UCLA and I went to music school and graduated guitar. Um, so. I, I did not know that I'm learning so much about you. To touch on Karate Kid specifically now, do you remember what you had to audition with to get that role? Yeah, it was a scene that was cut out of the film, funny enough. Um, I think it's out there somewhere in the rehearsal form. It's a scene where I confront Daniel at school right before the tournament and I hand him a death certificate. He's at a water fountain and uh, he says, what's this? So you got to get your mommy to sign that so you can be in the tournament with the big boys. And then he says, I thought it was supposed to be no contact. And then I say, yeah, well, accidents happen. And then I turn and walk away. He goes, hey, you think he might be wrong? And I say, who? He goes, your sense that you think he might be wrong. And then my line is, watch your mouth, asshole. So that was my scene. And I walked up, I grabbed John Allison. I said, watch your mouth, asshole. I had a headband on in my audition. I remember walking to the, I exited the room in this dramatic fa you know, fashion and then came back in, took my headband off and sat down in front of John and said, I'm sorry, that was Johnny. That wasn't Billy. And he got very like, hmm, so how old are you? And you know, you're a little bigger than our karate kid. And I said, yeah, well, you know, Bruce Lee was smaller than Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, but he beat him. He goes, yeah, that's true. That's true. So that was the scene. And then I read it with Ralph. Uh, that was the only scene that I auditioned for. I read it with, with Ralph. He read with a number of guys. Um, and they brought me to a room. The next audition was to basically stretch me out and see how limber I was and if they could work with me physically. And, uh, you know, uh, 10 hours later, I got the call. Oh, my. That's a really short process. <laughs> Yeah, well, over a period of a month and a half. Okay, okay. Busy. Yeah, this is like Whoa. waiting and they reading through people. And yeah, it was a long burn. I wasn't sure it was going to happen. Just because I'm curious now, was the headband thing in the character description when you first got, you know, your original sides? Or is that something that you brought to the audition? That was something I brought to it. I wore my headband. I came right from the gym, I think, in a tank top and a headband. And uh Felt, you know, felt tough. I didn't, hey, listen, at that time, I didn't know karate. I didn't know how to ride a motorcycle. The last thing I did was a milk commercial. So I figured, well, I better do something that looks sort of tough. So, you know. I feel, I feel like that's you instantly connecting to the character without knowing it because his headband's such an iconic part of the character. It's so true. Yeah, yeah. Became that. And then they then they said, okay, we love the headband idea. Then they got the long black one. and um, It was just a basic bandana, I think, on my audition. All right, let's talk a little bit about working with Ralph as a scene partner. So what's what's one thing that hasn't changed about him? Something that he did exactly the same way when you were making Karate Kid. And then on the other hand, what's something about when you hit the set with him for Cobra Kai that made you go, huh, like even after all these years, I didn't know you were capable of that. Well, our chemistry was it was kind of instant. John Avildsen cast the entire film so well, and all those all these relationships were. My 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 relationship with Ralph on the Karate Kid was, you know, training every single day for this final fight. So we had to trust each other. We got we learned together. We were very much in sync. Then he'd go off and do his his Daniel with Miyagi stuff, and then when we were film, I would I was basically attacking him, you know, until the end, and then we had to do that. So we, we had an instant. We had a we built a long relationship of trust, and it's instinctive. So when we go back and we we step into the dojo and in, in the first season of Cobra Kai, and he walks into the dojo, um, is a familiarity. Um, it's an instant chemistry that's not spoken, that's not it's effortless. Um, and then we uh, 
when we get into our physical stuff, our physical fighting, we're on the fast track because we, in a sense, already can anticipate by just looking at each other's eyes what's coming next. So um, that's something that's built in. Um, so it's a new experience working with them now because we're, you know, we're becoming partners, kind of seeing eye to eye and bat, you know, bumping heads. There's a lot of different levels and complexities in the, in the characters and in the relationship. So it's, it's much broader and much, much more uh, full to play those, those moments. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very familiar, I guess I could say, you know, easy in the sense of we trust each other with the wheel. All right, now jumping into what happened after the release of The Karate Kid. Is that a situation where it kind of blows the doors wide open to many, many new possibilities? And are you in a situation where, yeah, I know how this industry behaves. You do one thing really well and they want to keep giving you more of that thing and not even recognizing the fact that you might be possible of everything else. Yeah, those were the easy ones. I think, you know, and if I could do it again, I may have made different choices, um, but for me, it was just, I just, I, you know, first of all, no one saw the karate kid turning into classic, you know, at that moment, it was just a couple of years out, maybe you're out and parts are coming my way. I love acting. Um, so the roles came in, um, and, uh, but I auditioned for a lot of things, you know, I mean, I met Oliver Stone for platoon and, you know, I mean, so I've, I've been, I had those opportunities and I, and I had those auditions and stuff, but I think sure the business, you know, what's, they like to, to use what's working and what's familiar. But uh, yeah, but uh, I have no regrets. I, 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 I'm proud of all of it. I do like talking often about bumps in the road and either how you overcame them or like an important lesson that became very valuable from something that maybe didn't pan out. So bringing up some auditions after that that maybe didn't go your way. Is there any particular audition experience that is, you know, stuck with you even though you didn't go on to do that movie or show? No. I mean, all of them, each, each audition has a lesson in it. Every time you get or don't get something, you walk away from it. Um, you know, I got close on some, some very cool movies. You know, one of them was Days of Thunder. Um, it was Carrie Elway's Chris, uh, Chris Penn and myself for the, for the driver towards the end. And, um, you know, going through that, that, that door, you know, just being in the mix of those guys, me being considered for that was, was incredible. You know, um, so you walk away from that and you get the part, but you feel like, hey, they're looking at me in that light. That's a that's a cool thing. You know, that's a positive thing. Going into one you did get now, The Equalizer, your first multi-episode run on a TV show there. Is there anything you experienced working on that show or maybe even something that you observe Edward Woodward doing as a lead that you find coming in handy now leading Cobra Kai? That was my acting school, working with him. He was, I mean, one of the greatest actors of all time. I mean, he's just such a thespian. And all the actors, Robert Mitchum was on that. Uh, Shirley Knight, great actress, played my wife, uh, my wife, my mom. Um, not my wife. Um, but just working with all of them. Um, Edward, I'll never forget the first scene that we did together. It was in a hallway at this at the school, the music school. And I was going, doing my scene with, with him. And, um, you know, he, he said to me as I walked away, he says, you are a very good actor. You know, and I was like, wow, thank you. He goes, no, it starts in here and it comes out here. And I thought, wow, what a boost. Now, was I or not? I don't know. But it sure gave me a lot of confidence. You know? <laughs> and it made me feel, you know, and so I think you learn, you know, how generous he was, how giving he was. And, um, you know, and then what a what a professional. And, and, and he knew everything. He knew, you know, he knew he was fixing a light over there in the middle of his lines. He was just so in tune with the whole machine, which I think came from a lot of experience. And, and I do have that now because I've been behind the camera I know I would have directed, I've edited, um, you know, I've written, I've produced. So I know, I know the whole machine, you know, and, um, and I, he did at that time when I was a young actor. So I, he was very in tune with everything. And, and um, yeah, so I, I learned so much from him, just watching him, just working with him, his level, his intensity. He challenged me a lot. That was film. That was acting school for me working on that show. And, away from the teen, the teen kind of movies. Having spoken to so many of the young ensemble in Cobra Kai, I feel like you and Ralph are definitely bringing a similar sense of generosity to them. They always speak so highly of you guys and I love hearing about it. Yeah. I think the next thing on my list kind of brought me to the hot tub time machine area. And it was making me wonder, cause I'm surprised I've never even asked you this before. It's how did you first meet John, Josh and Hayden? And did meeting Josh have anything to do with your work in hot tub time machine? Yeah. So uh, J 
a hot tub time machine. I was, was an offer. They wrote Josh Heald wrote this character um, and they reached out to me and, and uh, basically went in and they had already shot the movie. They did some test screenings and there was apparently a dip somewhere in the middle and they wanted to bump something up. So they wrote a part and they had me in mind. And uh, so I met Josh that way. I walked into a room and he literally created this character for me and uh, for the movie. And, uh, and then uh, Hayden and John Horowitz came to visit because they were such good friends. Um, and they had reached out to me, Hayden and John reached out to me previous to that, to, uh, something about a Harold and Kumar sequel, um, right. didn't pan out, but I knew who they were and uh, we kind of instantly clicked all of us. It was kind of cool. Um, and I always thought somewhere in the back of my mind, I always had this feeling about those guys. I always thought, you know, one day we're gonna all, th all of us do something together um, many times. So when they emailed me out of the blue saying, we have an idea for a project. It felt like, oh yeah, here, here's that thing I've been feeling. Yeah. Well, it must be the most uh, incredible boost in confidence that you're you're called in to essentially fix a lull in a movie. They must have had. Some uh, that sounds wrong. No, <laughs> no, it was the scene. You know, I mean, it could anybody could have done it. You know, throw, <laughs> throw a mustache on it. It was the scene, but they thought, who could play this character, right? You know, and it was so fun. I love playing that guy. You know, he had a name. He had a first name, Rick. His name was Rick. And I remember being on set and, and uh, Steve Pink, who directed it, and Josh, they're like, we're trying to find an, his last name. And it just came to me. I go, his name's not Rick. It's Ricky. And his last name's Steelman. It's Ricky Steelman. The mustache. There's just something so funny about that name. All right. We got to touch on how I met your mother. And I want to know how exactly that came up and what your reaction was when you found out what their take on Karate Kid was, because they were essentially teeing up Cobra Kai. Yeah, in many ways. Um well, first of all, for, to get the phone call uh, to be uh, to do a guest spot on How I Met Your Mother just by itself was was thrilling. I'm just like, wow. They're and then they're, then they said we're gonna send you the script. So the script comes in and it's uh, there's a clown and there's Ralph Macchio and there's a clown and there's a clown and the clown and the, you know the pay, the last page is and the clown takes his makeoff off and it's me, you know. So I have no words the whole the whole thing until the very last. There's this little speech there at the end. I said, well, that's a safe way to bring me on television. Just <laughs> put me in a clown suit and zip my mouth up. Um, but uh, so that was so much fun. I mean, what a great, I can't say enough about, about that set, that crew and, and all those actors and how welcoming they made us feel. And, um, you know, what a, what a shot they gave me just to, to do that. Um, and it turned out great. So there, yeah, I, I knew about the show and I knew about Barney Stinson's, you know, take on who Johnny Lawrence was. And he was a real good guy, which was kind of like a, you know, a tick in his own character because he saw things so skewed, which made him so endearing. Um, so the fact that it made sense that he would think Johnny was the hero, like Darth Vader was the hero of Star Wars, you know, um, so it's comedy bit. Um, and then uh, and after that show, after it was just supposed to be that one off, I think. And then uh, then I got a call saying, um, you know, they want to have you back and they're going to bring you into season nine and, and give you a, a, you know, a few episodes, a bunch of episodes or whatever, and give you an arc. And that was that was that was just amazing. You know, and they wrote there as it was so strange to sit at a table with. You know, with Neil, Patrick Harris, and Kobe, and Jason um, Siegel, and see all their character names all around the table, and the table reads, you know, as Ted Mosby and Barney Stinson, and then there's a card there, and it says Billy Zabka. You know, Billy Zabka as himself. It was like, how am I? How did I break this wall? How am I on the show? I mean, I, was, I think I pinched myself a lot under the table, going, "This is incredible." And they were just such great actors and such, and they were so inspiring. And Neil, man. He would be getting ready to do the Tony Awards, host the Tony Awards and doing two other things while he's carrying the show. And uh, he's just a machine and just so gracious, so gracious. And so um, it's it just encouraging. And um, I'm just thankful. Pam Fryman, the director of that, was just the best. I love her. So if you're watching this, Pam, thank you again. All right. I don't want to jump into Cobra Kai without touching on Most. And I know in one of our last conversations, we spoke about it a little bit. So I'll just remind everyone that Most is an Academy Award nominated short film that you both co-wrote and produced. And it's well worth seeking out. And you admitted it. So I could say this now. It's online. You Google it and you can find it. Right. So I know when we last spoke, you described it as a labor of love and clearly it went on to be a great success. So how does an experience like that change your goals for yourself? What would you say is the biggest difference between what you were drawn to before the most experience and then after? Mm. Well, I, I was doing a lot of indie films uh, in, in Eastern Europe and Bulgaria and doing a lot of, you know, I'd read these scripts and they look like, hey, if you do this right, this could be good. And a lot of corners are cutting some of these lower budget things. And I was getting a little like creatively unsatisfied, to say the least. 
um, and wanted to make something that had some meaning and some depth. It was on the, on the heels of 9-11, two weeks after 9-11. Um, and um, the story jumped on me and my partner at the time. We're like, let's go and tell this story. Um, but, but it wasn't a career thing. It wasn't like, oh, I want to go and, you know, it wasn't about the Academy Awards. It was about doing something excellent. And we did something out of the box. We did something in Eastern Europe with a Czech cast. We shot it in Poland. It didn't make sense on paper. I mean, it was a big budget for this little 33 minute film that we put two years into. We battled floods. We battled negative 11, de 11 degrees on a, on a Polish drawbridge. And um, it was really an insurance battle to have to come back because our, our bridge broke. And then we, then when we were done, we cut it together and brought it through the festival circuit. And, um, and it just was, you know, started at Sundance and then it just picked up traction and people were responding to it. Um, and then next thing we're walking the red carpet, at the Academy Awards, you know, like three years later. And, um, you know, as a filmmaker, it's the difference of like making a movie as an actor or a show as an actor, you know, and then you, you, you walk away and six months later, eight months later, you, you see a premiere of it. But when you're doing everything and you're orchestrating the whole thing, you know, every painful step of the way to get to where you are, you know, you know, where you, you, every moment of that journey. So to, to be walking in, the, to be at the Oscars, which is such an honor, um, and it was just a great platform for the film, you know, and I stayed behind it. I didn't put myself out in front of it. I didn't do publicity about it and say, look at me. It wasn't about that. It was really so much about the film that I didn't want anybody to even know I had anything to do with it, but it was so great to be there. And then from that, it was, it was very um, encouraging that all the, all that I've learned over the years and all my, all my film school that I've been doing on sets and from the shows and from all these things, everything I set out to do back in college um, happened and, and was, um, you know, got a, a nomination for the, for the highest honor in, 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 in what I want to do. So that was, uh, if anything, just, a, you know, good feeling. You know, I didn't think of it in a strategic thing, like, Oh, now I'm going to go and do that. You know, I know I have that in my belly. I have that in my, I have that in my, in my box and I'll, I'll do something else again. Um, when the right timing is I'll get behind the camera and, uh, do something that, uh, comes from inside me. There's only one follow-up question to that. Have you revisited the possibility of directing an episode of Cobra Kai? <laughs> I've thought about it. I've thought about it, kicked around, talked to the guys about that. And maybe that's in the cards, you know. Um, I think at this point, we've been along for now four seasons. The rhythm's there. All the actors know each other. We trust each other. The machine's um, working. I mean, we have an amazing crew, amazing crew and cast. And, you know, it's great to, this thing happens so fast. We throw these, these episodes together pretty quick, an incredible schedule. Some of the hours are 12, 14 hours, sometimes 16 hour days. And it takes all of us at the same time to, to do that. So if I was going to direct, it would take a lot of extra time. So the moment comes, the right episode comes uh, with all my heart. I would, I would, uh, I would love to do that. I see that. So, so I see that in the cards. I, I'm not, I'm not angling for that, but when it's, when it's right, you know, I agree when the time is right, but I might be rooting for that to happen. The time is right. Yeah. I've got my hands full playing this guy and uh, you know, that, that's, uh, that's where my heart's at with the show right now. All right. Let's jump into some specifics here. Maybe let's go for the fight between Johnny and Cree. So I was wondering if you could kind of compare and contrast the fight in the beginning of season two to where we see them in that fight at the end of season three. And may maybe from a fight style perspective and keep in mind, I have limited knowledge here, but it, it does kind of feel like there's more precision and more intensity to the way that Johnny is fighting him in season three. So if that is the case, maybe what kind of discussions did you guys have to make sure that the audience doesn't just see a fight, but also sees character growth within that fight? The first fight is an emotional fight. The first fight is he hasn't seen this guy, thought he was dead. Um, this is the guy that steered him off track. And there's a lot of... Um, a lot of anger, a lot of pain in that first fight. It was a very an emotional fight, which can allow for it to be a little sloppier. Um, not a perfect, uh, you know, just technical martial art fight. The third one in season three is a, is a, a kind of a um, uh, righteous anger kind of. It's, a, you know, when he took away the dojo at the end of season two and it became Kreese's dojo that moment when he, you know, he's been betrayed again. Johnny's been betrayed. He let Crease into his life, into his heart. He cared for him. He gave him a chance. And now all of a sudden he just stabbed him in the back. Um, 
that was a, the lowest point besides Miguel getting injured. Right. And then, um, so at the end of, uh, you know, in season three, when, uh, when it's gone too far and, um, he's injured Miguel again and, um, Johnny's going back. So there's a lot of, uh, intention in the fighting style. Um, and in my performance of it too, it's, it's a little, so it's kind of all together, but it's not a conscious discussion. Like, you know, Hey, the first one's gonna be a little more gorilla kind of more street slop. And this one's going to be a little more, uh, you know, a, a target. So, um, it was mostly about the emotion of it. And I think that translates through the fighting style and the precision and intensity and the intention of each move. Um, so it was very, I love that. I love kicking the door down. It felt good. It felt good because it felt as good as it did bad when he when he was saying, you know, it's, I started Cobra Kai, you know, it's mine, you know, and Johnny has to leave this tail between his legs, this experiment that he tried, and he's trying to help all these kids, and you know, and now boom, it's, it's you know, this guy pulls it out from under him on top of Miguel getting injured. I mean, that's a super low point. So it was a high point for him to come back in and just get his power back, um, especially where he was at at the beginning of the season, which was completely. Um, licking his wounds and feeling responsible for this whole train wreck. And um, so at the end of it, uh, he, you know, and that's on the, also on the heels of Ali setting him free to go find his true love. So he's, he's rising up again. And that's a, that all played in the fight. Revisiting all this gets me so pumped all over again. Specific, <laughs> specific beat now within that, uh, the season three fight between Johnny and Kreese. If Robbie hadn't yelled at Johnny to stop, do you think that Johnny still would have dropped the sigh or would he have used it? He would have probably used it, but he would have probably been non-lethal. I think at that moment he was out of control, but I don't know. Um, I knew he was going to stop me. So that was a good thing. <laughs> but he, you know, I think, uh, you know, sometimes you get in a fight and someone's, you know, you're puffed up to fight someone and they're like, Somebody breaks it up and you're like, yeah, you're lucky that that guy just broke it up, you know, but you really relieved inside. So I don't know. At the moment of that, you know, I, I think not. I think he would have, I don't think he would have used it. I don't think Johnny's capable. Honestly, I don't think Johnny's capable of that. I think that he may have um, trapped him. He may have pinned him. He may have shown him that he won. Um, he may have threatened him, um, dominated him with it, but he wouldn't have injured him. I know that. There, there's too many lessons learned along the way that if like, if Robbie hadn't been the first thing to stop him, something else that he learned in his own mind, I think would have. Yeah, All right, yeah. I'm gonna have to let you go soon. I can't believe we're almost out of time. I have to ask you about season four. And I know that the last time I asked you for season three details before it came out, you couldn't give much of a tease. I know that's gonna be the case here. So instead, I'll approach a season four question the same way you answered the season three question here. How does Johnny feel at the end of season three? Where, where exactly is his head at in that last moment? It's a complicated feeling. For one, you know, he has a, um, Daniel just pretty much saved him. You know, Chris was just about to choke him out. Um, so he, I think he's purged at that moment. It's a, there's an emptiness of it, of it in it, but as a, a he's, um, empowered with Daniel and it's, there's a good feeling of bearing the hatchet. So at the end of that, but there's also, um, there's an intensity. They have a common foe increase now. Um, so the feeling of that was, um, let's, was a relief in a sense of, um, I have a partner and uh, we have the same, we have the same goal here. Um, but we have a lot of work to do and there's still a lot of history between us and we're both different and we, you know, it's like, we want this to work. And, um, and here we go. You did it well again. You, you, played, you, played, you played by the rules, but you gave me a little something to think about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot to clean up here with these kids all coming together. And now we have to march on into, uh, into the battle. And, you know, these are two complex characters um, but who are so similar, but so different. Has anything felt different filming season four now that you are fully under the Netflix umbrella, both production wise, but also maybe just having a different vibe on set because your fan base just grew exponentially. It was already a very powerful group of people, but 
the amount of discussion has just gone from like one level to through the stratosphere. And even from a fan perspective, it has been so exciting to see that and to feel that. So I can't even imagine how it changed the vibe on set. Yeah. It, it's just encouraging. You know, it's like, you know, you, you have a good show and, and, and you know, you have a, a matinee and, and the, the curtains close and people are applauding and they like it. Um, and, you know, you got the evening show coming now and you got to go out and, you know, you know, there's a sense of, OK, it's working. They like it. And uh, a new kind of energy um, of, um, you know, it, it feels good. It feels good when it's when it's working and that. But as an actor, my job is is to you know, stay in the focus, stay in the, in the micro of it. You can't you can't be swayed by that. You can't be looking at that. You know, it's like you know, if you're a baseball player and you're up at bat, you know, you can't you can't look to the left and see who's in the who's in the stands. You got to keep your eye on the ball. So we're all doing that, keeping our heads tucked. The writers are doing their thing and uh, we're putting our hearts on our sleeves and beating our arms up and um, shooting big and wide and the stories are deep and wide. And uh, I think we're going to deliver a great season four, but it's been, it's awesome. It's awesome. It's great. I'm very happy to, I mean, why not? You know, why, why do this if people are going to like it? <laughs> I'm so excited for you guys. Keep your eye on the ball when you're on set, but I hope you guys are all like celebrating, just recognizing the fact that you're delivering great work and it's making so many people out there just so incredibly happy, myself included. Billy, thank you so much for hanging out with us on the channel again. You're always such a treat and pleasure to talk to. Me too. Thank you so much. All right. To everyone out there, you know what to do. Go over to Netflix and... I mean, even if you've already watched it, just re-binge it, re-binge it, share your favorite scenes in the comments section below. Tell us how much you love the show. Thanks for watching this edition of Collider Connected. We'll see you soon with more of them. <laughs> <laughs>